Welcome to another episode of Capturing the Intangibles podcast. Today we host the best looking dude in the software industry, Nunzio Esposito, which I'm being coached as the proper Italian way of pronouncing. Nunzio drops by to share his knowledge on design and debate whether there really is any such thing as a single user experience. Enjoy. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the podcast. Um, Today, this is our second one, and today we have a special, really special guest. Um, And I'm going to spell his name finally correctly, because everybody in the world says his name so wrong, you know, good Italian has to speak, you know, very good Italian, right? So we have here with us Nunzio Esposito. So don't say Esposito, say Esposito, <laughs> right? And uh, Nunzio, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, what you do these days with us? Sure. Yeah, what's your role? Yeah, sure. um, you want the long, long synop- or a synopsis? Oh, uh, we, have, we have 30 minutes, so... Oh. <laughs> the fun version so for the, the intro version. or yeah, the entire the podcast. Topic. Um, so currently, you know, I oversee experience design at Infor. Uh, I've been at the company for roughly almost seven years now, and we've gone through a lot of different variations and manifestations over the years. Uh, but now currently, I think we're really po- uh, positioned to drive really meaningful change based on better usability across all of our product portfolio. Uh, so I have, I see, oversee a global team of designers, uh, and that includes user research, uh, UX engineering. Um, you can even say aspects of design ops, uh, over, roughly around 60 people right now, uh, and growing. And, uh, on the side, uh, because I think it's important for everybody to know, uh, if I'm not designing and making strategic decisions based on, uh, digital products, I work on a physical product at the same time. Um, So I consider myself a mechanic, uh, an enthusiast, or a hobbyist of um, old British cars. So those are kind of like MG, uh, Triumph, Jaguar. Um, I work them on the weekends. I get my hands dirty there, and then I get my hands dirty uh, on my MacBook Pro. That's that's really awesome. And again, welcome uh, in our podcast. So Nunzio, last week um, with Mike and Rick, we were talking about this 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 problem that we have today in the world of where consumer technologies are getting adopted, you know, very quickly. While in the enterprise, we are struggling, right? So we're struggling. We have all these technologies, but we're struggling to adopt that. And and I think in the areas that you are focusing, you know, um, and they're very expert. Uh, probably you see that the user experience, you know, in the in the consumer world, we have a very very nice, simple, easy to use uh, things. Uh, while in the enterprise, well, we are challenged there. You know, what's your view on that? Oh, you have to start there. Uh, so, I mean, look, I I agree. I mean, the, you know, enterprise applications typically uh, don't ultimately promote let's just say a a consumer experience. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think the challenge there is from my perspective, um, that's actually really hard to create. And Mm -hmm. what I mean by that, a lot of consumer experiences today that we consume, let's just say more importantly, part of our daily lives, um, they were born in that context or born in that time when that happened. So now through consumerization of technology, Technology is a commodity and, you know, we have our smart homes and and houses. We have applications to let us know that, um, you know, my delivery came or my Alexa is like, you know, you want to add that to your shopping list. So because of those technologies, um, it does come with an expectation that the way in which I engage there is the way in which I will engage with work. But the problem was the work application, especially on an enterprise level, they happened decades before. And because of they happened decades before, they take on, I don't want to say a legacy, but they take on that technical debt. And mm-hmm. um, because of that technical debt, that's where the challenges lie in the consumerization of enterprise software. Um, and it has so much more to do than just the UI or um, whatever that visual or um, you know, um, interface is that I'm engaging with. It has to do with the APIs, the connectivity. Um, so those are a lot of the challenges that uh, reside there. So it bothers me when everyone goes, 
you know, we have design at our company, it could be at mm-hmm. Infor or somewhere else. And they're like, and we build consumer grade experiences because like reality is like, no, you don't. Mm-hmm. And, and in that, I think we need to switch the terminology and really define what we're trying to do. And for us, it's all about user productivity and, and ultimately trying to create user satisfaction, meaning a con- emotional connection to my work. And if the yeah. interface, whatever that interface may be, can support that, then that's actually a really good UX. Yeah. And so, Mike, any opinion on this? You know, I, I, you know, I, I think you, you love the enterprise grade UIs or not? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, <laughs> given, given my background, uh, working on more data platform technologies, mm-hmm. like there's always this the easiest way to show information is to just drop a data grid everywhere. And Mm so you just have a tiled Excel type of experience and it's very informative, but it's completely overwhelming. And I I really appreciate um, a lot of consumer UI trends. I appreciate what Nunzio's team puts together in terms of giving us design components and libraries that help articulate information in a way that's easily absorbable. Because otherwise I think half the battle is that consumer interface adoption, button optimization or clicking optimization, if you make it difficult or challenging to use the software, it doesn't matter how powerful it is in a lot of cases, people are just not going to take uh, well to it. And and it's actually interesting to me, everything that you say, Nunzio, because um, your consumers aren't really uh, the customers of the product, right? Your your consumers are actually the product itself. So mm-hmm. for us, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's us. We're giving you requirements. You're giving us a a feed of components, design, aesthetics, principles, and we have to work together in concert and partner up to to develop a lot of these new capabilities and think about how do we not lose the customer while giving them new and refreshing experiences in the cloud that they've never been able to do on prem or with legacy type infrastructure and software approaches before. Yeah, but but you hit something on here because like the data grid. You know, like if you had to, like, I have many thorns in my, (laughs) like pain points across everything that we do, but the data grid, I mean, you have to understand that, um, from a user's perspective, there's a lot of comfort there. So it's an expectation, you know, you, you brought up Excel as you gave your, you know, your, your POV and like, I don't think we should like, let's not sleep on Excel, so to speak. What I mean by that is like, it's a business application. It's used by, I don't, I don't know the number, but let's just say like everybody. I mean, it, even my it, mom knows what Excel is. It's okay? the biggest so like, enterprise application <laughs> everyone's competing yeah, with. So actually. It's a good application. Sure. Maybe the toolbar is complex because I think it is. Um, and sure. Maybe I'm not, I don't consider myself an Excel expert, but do I use Excel? Yes. And does it serve my purpose and my needs when I use it? Yes. So there is a comfort when it comes to data grid and looking at data density and and how that is organized. So it's hard for us to step out of that boundary and go, it shouldn't be a data grid. It, re- it needs to be X or I don't as a user, we think I don't want to see all that data when the reality is like they do. Yeah. So so, you know, it's, 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 it's a challenge to satisfy what we think is a good experience when the end user really is saying, I want that. And where we need to start to change that conversation is in extending some of the aspects that it's offering to really start to uh, personify a new way of looking at that data. And we have an example of that that we did uh, for a lot of our HR tools, and we developed a new pattern that came out of it which fundamentally was just as I go to look at a data grid and I see all this data and sometimes like no joke, it could be like 15,000 records. Like Mm -hmm. you're going, is that even possible? And all we wanted to do was just make it a configurable aspect that a user could decide what type of summary or area that they wanted to highlight when they loaded that data grid or loaded that page. And what that ended up doing was, creating a way of showing hierarchy around a specific data set before they dove into the data grid. Now, does it look good? Like I'd say visually, yeah, it looks good. Did we get good feedback from our uh, constituents, meaning our user base that like, oh, this is something they really like? Yes. But what they don't know is we're actually starting to change the paradigm and the way in which they look at data in the data grid. And yeah. we're, design- we're reverse engineering where we really want to go 
but yet we're opening up the conversation to show that progress can happen from the data grid. And that's how you start to change uh, that the culture of it. Okay. And uh, I'm curious about what, you know, Rick's point. Um, it's so funny that when we start to work together on a, on a, on a specific service with Rick, um, he's, he's going to hate me that I'm going to bring this up. When we talked about, you know, Rick talk, worked on document management, you know, a couple of years ago. And we were discussing all the time how this user experience of your document, a service like a document management, you know, which has a lot of data, a lot of documents uh, looked like. Um, but so what's your perspective, Rick, on, on consumers, you know, consumer UX versus enterprise UX? Well, you brought up document management, so now I've got a totally different spin on that because that's got its own. <laughs> that's got its own thing. But I, I, I'm trying to connect the dots here because Nunzio, I loved what you said about user productivity and how that's actually what you're going for here. And then Mike comes in and says, "Well, it's it's about the technology that facilitates that." But we're, I think, what we're trying to do is unpack how do we get out of this mess of complicated UIs. So I was talking with. Frank Zhang on our team, who, who you guys know, we were talking about the Gen Z test. Could we drop in a college graduate right out of college into these enterprise systems? Nine, no, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, you're not, they're not going to be able to do it. Yeah, but correct. Does, that, does that fundamentally change the way that you look at technology choices in the future, even at the enterprise level? And I, I'm going to get to this giant leaps concept, Mosmo, that we talked about last time, but... <clears throat> Aren't you really buying and looking for that, uh, call it architectural foundation that allows you to define user productivity to whoever you want? Shouldn't that be mm -hmm. not, not only the software vendor's perspective and point of view, but potentially also the consumers and customers? Because, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've got a lot of um, debt here, let's say, from these legacy systems and everything Nunzio said. Eventually, that's going to have to change. So as you dig yourself out of that, how do you get there? Is this one of those giant leaps that we've been talking about? Is that giant yeah. leap, does it start at the architectural level to where now we can create all these grand visions that Nunzio and his team put out that are so great because we've got all these microservices running everywhere and, and users can just define how they interact with the system whenever they want, right? I think mm -hmm. that's ultimately where we're trying to go. Yeah, but I think also to come back on the last last you know last week podcast, I think one thing that is how in our heart is the culture and building teams, right? So, Nunzio, for your perspective, you know, how can you create a team or a culture uh, in a software vendor or a customer running you know an IT you know with a CIO? How can you create a you know design first or design thinking culture? So that that eventually materialize in a solution that it is powerful, productive, and useful. How can you do that? Because a lot of people think that they know what UX is, but those are the guys that build forms with you know hundred fields, put it randomly somewhere on a form, and they say, "Oh, I can do UX," right? right. But that's actually not true. So how can we build that culture with? Good, productive, with taste as well. And you are Italian, of course. We Italian have good taste, right? So, how can you create that culture um, and that skill set? You know, for that. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's a couple of things. One, I want to pick up on where Rick was going before I get into the culture piece, because mm -hmm. um, how I digest what Rick is saying is, we don't want to prescribe the way in which the experience needs to be. Okay. When you prescribe something, you immediately alienate a user because you can't design, especially in an enterprise space, the way in which Mike wants to work against the way in which Rick might want to work to the way in which I might want to work. So if we can focus more on the enablement of the technology and build tools that offer better configuration and better personalization, and that is democratized across the entire enterprise experience, that's a win. That's user productivity and user satisfaction because you're giving me building blocks and I can set it up the way that I want. That's like anything in life. Like you buy a house, you like the structure, but you design it the way you want because you want it to be an extension of who you are. There needs to be a comfort level. It needs to work the way that I want. Um, can I and, give it an example, yeah. Nunzio? 
Like I like, yeah. and let's get back to the culture here in just a second. And Mossmo's going to hate me for this, but I, you'll love it, right? And hopefully you side with me on this. Look at something as simple as as uh, Office or your Outlook, right? Massimo yeah. and, and I have gone back and forth on this for years, ever since we started working together, right? I I sort things by conversation because it drives me nuts not knowing what the last piece of, of that conversation is, right? Okay. Massimo doesn't do that. So sometimes I see him responding on things that other members of his team have done and it drives me, oh my God, it drives me nuts. And the same thing with like previews. I don't know if you keep preview open. Why should I have to click and double click to open up the email in order to respond? Like it's just faster for me to just fan through those as fast as possible. So it's like those types of little features, right? And I, we're talking at a very micro well, level, so, but that's a difference so in taste. You, yeah, yeah, so I'll tell you right now, you guys use Outlook any way that you want. I have it because that's what we use, I use too. But the way I use it is I just don't check it. Because like, <laughs> like that's a fact, by the way, it is a fact. Now <laughs> I know. you never respond to me. <laughs> no, well, I do other ways, you know, like I think, I think that should be the side takeaway from this podcast is like, if anybody's trying to email me, you might not hear from me, meaning you're never <laughs> yeah. going to hear from me. Um, but the reality is like, I don't use the preview preview. I still look at it in classic, classic view or whatever outlook is saying they have a new toggle that they just released to, yeah. to buy the new outlook i tried it and i got scared like literally from like scared because i was going man this is actually a really cool looking ui but like what the f did you just do to my ux paradigm like mm -hmm. this is not the way i look at it and i immediately went back to the old view so so in 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 essence what is really good that Office is doing, and especially Outlook for the use case we're using right now is, they offer choice. Mm -hmm. And in that choice, there's multiple ways in which you can digest and view that content and interact with it. And fundamentally, that's ultimately the value that they're delivering. And that's the way we need to be looking at a lot of the, thing, the decisions we're making uh, across our applications, our enterprise applications. But and we're doing but I'm good. let's go back on the culture because oh, you know culture, are, yeah. yeah because how do you build a team that design first design thinking but yeah, also so. nurture that culture to people that maybe don't listen to it but then embrace that change right so yeah, how so. do you how do you go to a development manager let me let me put it you know bluntly to it how do you go to a development manager that that he or she was used to build a form with hundred fields, you know, reflecting the database model. And now you say, change this, you know, this doesn't work anymore. You know, how do we yes. build that culture? So look, I'm biting, my, I was biting my bottom lip. And if anybody hasn't seen me before from prior videos and things, like you will notice that there's a lot more gray in my chin and I got a gray strike streak coming down like my hair. Here's the reality. It's not one size fits all. And when you, everyone says that they're design led and everybody wants to be design led, but you can't just take a designer and inject them into a conversation and think that something mag magical is going to come out of it because it fundamentally doesn't work that way. There is no, there is no concrete way to f a mathematical equation or to formulate a plan to get a better design outcome. What we've learned over the years as we've matured and we've gone through a ton of iterations of what design meant at Infor, where we are today is that we need to be a little bit more uh, facilitative and, uh, and, and orchestrate more than say what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why I start there. Until you build a collaborative con connection to who you're working with, the dev leader that sees 15,000 forms and, you know, that's the way that this needs to be to a product manager who is just trying to get something done, which most of the time that's what we've encountered. If you cannot wire up those two uh, entities, like those two people in such a way to then open up the conversation around what if or maybe we should consider this, fundamentally design will fail. That is it. It just, it fails. It's like, you had me at hello. Like, no, 
not mm-hmm. happening. So isn't but, that kind of isn't that kind of also getting into the ethos of service design to some degree? It's really not just about mapping it, it, inputs of a requirement and then here's your component. Exactly. Go ahead and yeah, hundred percent, Mike. But even there, I'm going to challenge you. You don't coin it. As soon as we define something, something, we immediately make it almost unapproachable. Like I, I can't get with it or it becomes intimidating. Or it becomes a goal itself. Yeah. yeah. Like that's what we learned. Like we were called hook and loop. We were a creative agency inside this enterprise software. That's a problem because you're pointing to design instead of trying to become part of design. It's the same thing when we say like, I want better UX. No, you're trying to achieve better usability. Don't call it UX because that points to someone who's doing that function, make it usability, which means we're all accountable to it. And we need to work together to achieve what that desired outcome needs to be. So it is an aspect of service design, Mike. And I agree with you completely. Like I could Google search that and yes, it's going to come up with some of the things I'm saying, but reality is I think that the designers that we represent on our team, they want to feel like in for like, I know that sounds crazy, but like we want to be a part of the conversation. Once you become part of the conversation, then you need to understand where to push and honestly, where to bite your tongue. And that's what we learned over the last two to three years. You want to evolve the culture. You want everyone to be design led, not meaning we own, we support, we help guide. You're the owner. We want you to succeed. Hey, dev leader, like we really want to understand all the challenges. What does feasibility really look like from your perspective until you get into those convos, then you get into, well, what is, what can we do now? And what do we want to do later? And we don't know, we don't know and what's going to happen later, but you know what? Like we're cool at that because we're going to do it together. It's the concept of like family, shared success, shared accountability. And those have been the keys to success for us over the last 18 months. And what we're really trying to do is use that as the ripple effect to scale uh, more broadly. Yeah. One other thing that, um, you know, as a, you know, as a product manager or dev lead, you know, most of the time I would go back to the development team and say, hey, guys, you know, this is really good work. But at the end, I wouldn't demo this. You know, if I would go to a customer and yeah, this is going to be a piece of the solution that I wouldn't demo because I don't feel that UX is really thought through in a good way. Right. Um, And, you know, I actually have the philosophy, real leaders, really good leaders should demo their own products. You know, because then it comes from the top. It comes from the top, right? That if the UX is not good, then it's embraced in all the culture and the organization that we should really have a good solutions that really good, look good and they are productive. Um, the one thing that I'm struggling these days is if you, Mike, you're you're busy with a big data solution, right? Uh, from info perspective, how do you, you know, make a big data solution working with a simplified UX? You know, what would be your view on that, because there's a lot of big data solution out of there, but of course you can't put everything on the screen. You can, you know, it, our human brain can deal with big data. And so how do you bring that big data to a simple view of it? So I think what Nunzio said is actually kind of interesting on the HR side, right? So he's talking about dealing with 15,000 rows and presenting mm-hmm. that on a, on a, on a screen. And I thought that was cute because 15,000 rows is like a single file on a big data platform for us. Right. <laughs> so, so like we're scaling this way, way higher. That's when I of, say gas. Yeah. Anyway, keep going, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I think our scale is, is fundamentally a little bit different because also the other thing is that in a big data world, so much of this data, it's so valuable to have, but not all of it is valuable to present to the user to consume all at once. You can't digest that volume of information. And so it's finding tools and patterns to better present that, or at least give them a way into how do I actually want to consume this information and data. So developing tools that allow them to run queries against that information without over encumbering them with this entire, you know, huge, huge like matrix like data grid. I think is mm-hmm. is always a struggle and you're always trying to tweak and improve the patterns to figure out, you know, why are people spending only two or three button clicks or 10 seconds here and then moving on to a different part of their workflow because it's not really enjoyable. So that's always a struggle, but we're always constantly making inroads. We're working with Nunzio's team as well. And I think pretty effectively um, because it's also recognizing that 
what big data is designed to solve is really, at least today, more oriented towards driving consumer and self-service experiences in other domains. You know, big data helps drive data consumption in analytics, reporting, uh, AI and machine learning, and all these other experiences. So we need to know also what our charter and what our job is and who our customers and consumers are. We might not be you know, delivering information to Jerry and Sally in finance as a daily driver consumer app, but right. we do have those upstream BAs, data administrators, DBAs, those types of personalities that we need to appeal to. We give them powerful tools that allow them to process an immense amount of data and scale of data yeah. that they haven't had an opportunity to do before. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. And Rick, what's your perspective on that? And maybe you're more also on the mobile side, right? So yeah, I mean, if we're talking specifically about big data and AI, the biggest thing that I come across is, and, and maybe it's about the usability side too, because you you can compare it to, you know, moving to a new way of doing my job that I've been doing for 20 years. It comes down to trust. So if it's if it's the application screen I'm working with, and let me abstract that even more and get down to the data level and the AI level. If I don't have those interactions to where I can build that trust, I think you're never going to have that giant leap, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's, hey, can I start to simulate these sort of things so that I can get used to it? Or how can I help facilitate this through? I think that gets back down to the usability and being able to choose. But also, maybe at some point, hopefully soon, we're going to get to the point to where, Mike, you talk about you know, IT users and you have to provide them the tools. That's always going to be one of our big charters. But why can't we get to the level to where you know, as a business analyst or as a, a, a finance or HR administrator, why can't I start to play around with that data too? And that actually gets back to the culture thing. The culture, the culture aspect is something that I'm, I'm so unbelievably passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that we have fortunate, especially in, in this group here, is that we're very passionate about creation. So not only, not only from the perspective of software vendors, but also all of our customers, every enterprise out there, I'm of the belief that your HR practices are going to be centered around that creation aspect or quality in people, specifically technology mm -hmm. creation, because that's how you get even closer and finding more, more appeal to your user experience and that flexibility, but also how I interact with my data and extract more um, insights and create more business value and domains. It comes back to that culture and hiring people that are just naturally creative and inquisitive and willing to take those giant leaps. Yeah, yeah, well, you're getting yeah, but you're getting you're getting that paradigm because of the advancements of technology and the consumerization of it, meaning it, democratization of it, right? Like anybody can get it. What you're doing is you're you're changing the 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 need of skill sets. Skill sets are evolving, and what you're really hitting on from a cultural aspect is that you're really looking at future talent and growth opportunities, meaning talent you currently have. In how can they look at a current paradigm or current situation and know that like that current situation or current paradigm that I'm I'm in, it could always be better. And and once you get hit on that concept of you, there's always areas to improve. And I think that's a problem. I mean, I'm prescribed Zoloft because of my OCD because I'm always trying to go like everything I need to do has to always constantly improve. Um, thank God for that prescription drug. I just said that publicly. But reality is that like, that's the type of, I don't know if you want to say emotional intelligence or skill set. that's what's really going to be required for today and tomorrow. And the but challenge- Nunzio, is But Nunzio, if you have a candidate in front of you, right? So for product design or design thinking, you know, whatever role, what is the key question or key skill that you're looking for? Is this, if there is that one thing that you have a candidate in front of you, what is that, ha, huh, this person I'm going to hire? So that's really good. I mean, if we get into that level, because we have different, we have a series of steps to become, you know, say a part of our, our team, part of the family. Um, but if we get into that level, it has less to do with skill set and more around mindset. Um, you know, trying to really come up with a conversation and a response mechanism with this uh, candidate that we can get into the psyche of like, you know, um, let's just say like, you know, the concept or the work that you're doing, you have to constantly degrade it to get something done. Let's just mm -hmm. use that one as an example. Well, do you see that as progress or is that a failure or 
do you get agitated? Because the reality is if you have to degrade something you're doing, but you're doing something new, that's progress in its own right. Mm -hmm. So it's the concept of like embracing failures, um, knowing that doing something is better than doing nothing, you know? So one of the dev leaders I work closely with, uh, Eric Ryerson, he's like version one is better than version none. And Absolutely. I mean, that's a really kind of principle or philosophy to operate in. Um, so, you know, it's, that's, it's uh, someone, Nunzio, that's what I told to my kids when they start to work, they, they, they were making three euros per hour. I said, that's better than zero euro, right? Yeah, but <laughs> exactly. I mean, but there's, there's validity in that. I mean, mm -hmm. reality is that like, you know, nothing is ever going to come easy progress and innovation and doing things a new way. If it was easy, like, I'm going to be honest with you, like everybody would be doing it. It's yeah. not easy. We're creatures of habitual routine and habit. So to yeah. be able to pursue a change in a routine, a process, a workflow, you name it, um, you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's a motto that I say to my team day in, day out. And that's what we're really looking for in future talent. It's less skill set and more mindset. Love it. Love it. Really good. And same from product managers. By the way, I always say there is no education in product management. Either you study marketing or engineering. There is no product yeah. management. So you become an expert on a domain. That's fine. But it's all about your mindset, you know, you know, and the personality. If you have that, yeah. you're going to be a great product manager as well. I do yeah, want to go to, uh, to something uh, for you. I hear this. You got to hear mm -hmm. this because Mike dropped service design, which someone can Google. And if anyone is going to Google after this, like get googly with what we're saying, right? Mm -hmm. um, reality is that like you can look up UX unicorn. It's called UX unicorn. But basically what it means is, is like a designer today needs to understand the business, needs to understand the marketing, needs to understand the psyche of product management and what devs constraints are. Like mm -hmm. fundamentally, you can't just sharpen your skills in one area because like it's not about that. Like one area is a, a piece of the overall equation around being able to achieve something. Absolutely. And, you're and the spider in the web, I call it, right? So like a product. Oh. But the thing is, uh, so, so with, with service design, you know, my brother, uh, my brother went down to, um, to SCAD down in Georgia, and that's okay. where they were really promoting service design. So he was right ahead of the curve. And then yeah, I think uh, just a little while later, all of a sudden I hear it just dropping everywhere. Everyone's promoting yeah. this new design yeah, yeah. way of thinking. Of course. And I, Idea was putting out con uh, podcasts and content promoting this concept as well. You had the Danes that were really, really hot on this. And so like, I, I totally get what you're coming, where you're coming from, Nunzio. That's just design, dude. Yeah. Like, honestly, but, that's but just like, design. It, it's, it's an ethos. And then it like it gets mar market saturation. And all of a sudden, it's yeah. like, now you're aspiring to yeah, just check thing. the boxes. And now we're going to move on to like, you yeah. know, the next little hot trend, like, you know, Neo skeuomorphic yeah, design or whatever. That's why I'm still on an iPhone X and not getting the 12. Like seriously, man. Oh, I'm on a 12 way. already. Uh, so it can be legacy, right? So you have to. Be oh, man, you have iPhone 13. That's awesome. awesome. Oh. <laughs> he still uses hey, Nunzo, Outlook 2005. I mean, yeah, Nunzo, I do want to go to a statement that you did on stage, I believe, two years ago in a forum, oh, and God. you said, "Hey guys, AI, AI is the new UI." Right. And um, personally, I don't know if the AI is the new UI, but what did you mean by that? And, and, and can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So first of all, if I said that, which I probably don't remember, but you probably do, Massimo, because you're like good like that archaeologically. Um, <laughs> the reality is it's probably it's set wrong and it's probably interpreted wrong. UI immediately means user interface. And I think that there is a, there's a understanding that when you say UI today, it means something I can see mm -hmm. and something I can look at. And what was really that meant to say is it's just another user interface. It's just a different way to engage or interact. Mm -hmm. And AI is what we call, you know, converse, you might've heard this term conversational UX. Um, you know, no, no UI is good UI. I mean, there's a ton of trendy, um, you know, uh, adjectives or sayings or metaphors that came out when AI, uh, became a capability. Mm -hmm. But I think what, what, I think what we've learned through the years is 
a, a lot of facets and I'd like to ping, uh, especially Rick and Mike into this conversation because reality is the technology is there, but the ways in which people are consuming it and engaging with it fundamentally still, I don't think ultimately understands what that, that user paradigm really is. I, I really so, agree. Yeah. Totally and agree. The reason why, and the reason why you see that is because we have the capability to do all those things today. And like, let's just say adoption, we have some customers that are going like, this is amazing. And then some customers are going like, I just want to know what time it is. And like, that's not what AI and enterprise software is all about. So like, there's clearly a dissonance there. There's a separation. Yeah, but then when, absolutely. You get to, when you get to the consumer side of the things, I mean, the last time I checked when Amazon dropped something for the Echo, like there's like 17 different Echo devices. And last time I checked of the 17, it's like 12 or 13 of them have a freaking display attached to them. So mm -hmm. reality is people like we are creatures of visual reference. Exactly. And if there's no visual reference, I don't know what the hell you're saying. Yeah. And like people start thinking like they're spying on them. Is the FBI in my, uh, my house and what the F is going on here? And they ripped them out of their, you know, ripped them out. So like it's technology is really good, but if it, the audience in which it's going to serve is not ready for it, sometimes you, you, you really need to understand what that change management or rollout process is. Yeah. And, and that, that, that's how I leave absolutely. It. Rick, are you, you worked on the initial, you know, digital assistant and uh, our Coleman AI. What's your view on this? Yeah, well, I, I kind of, I echo what Nunzio is saying and I identify with it 100%. Um, and I've got a new spin on where that visual aspect's going to because we're doing the same thing. Like when we, when we first started on, we call it Coleman DA, digital assistant, but there's a visual aspect to that too. And we envisioned that back when we first created it is how can I interact with this? And that's what the user experience is. It's not web UI, it's not a screen, it's just my interaction. Right. Mm -hmm. So and we're starting to see that pick up, not at not at the pace that ultimately I would like, but I, I, I get that my interaction paradigm is a little bit different than others. But I, I appreciated what Nunzio said at the beginning when he introduced himself about being like this mechanical guy, right? Likes to be hands on. I'm kind of the same way. I, I'm sorry, I, I think about, you know, I would love to have a smart board and my daily work be as close to like physically hands on as it could be. Because I don't necessarily want to be in a program like this all day because it just, you know, I sit here in this chair. It's not, is it really that fulfilling? You have to think about those sort of things when it comes to experience and design and all those things. It's, it's, it's a feeling, right? So, you know, when we go into things like Coleman Dig, our, our, our users going to interact on kiosk, on smart boards, on um, new Echo, Echo devices to where you've got, you know, things that you can select, not just with voice. It's always evolving. And you have to, that's why I always come back to really what we're describing is, is that when we're building software personally to us, we're always thinking about it is it needs to be as flexible as possible so that from an experience perspective, you can create and do what you want. And I think that's going to be the giant leap that we're talking about here. And that's why. But, isn't, but Rick, isn't also something like if the AI of the AI is the UI, isn't that really not only UI that gives you a physical or visual thing where you can deal with, but isn't really like telling well, you what's next? It, right? Yeah, it's, it's a progressive you know? thing too. Like we, we've yeah. had these conversations in the past about what is augmented things, what is full automation. And I think it's building that trust to get there. So, you know, as you get more hands on, you know, individuals are going to want to interact in different ways. And as they get more comfortable, they may move to an echo device and they may start to trust, oh, this is how I've interacted with my data in the past, go to full automation, right? And I, I respect that, but we're not quite there yet. But where exactly. companies, I think, are going to make ginormous leaps because we all know everything throughout the history of, of humankind, it gets commoditized. So mm -hmm. where is the value? Where is the value in your organization? It's in your data. So if you start mm -hmm. hiring, building a culture around this creation or experimentation or design-led principles that I should be able to create a new way to do my work, the, that's going to be the giant leaps for companies here, here soon, is who can actually start taking advantage of those principles we've been talking about for five years now. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, you own a Tesla, right? So I always... <laughs> I I, I always, I, yeah. It's, it's not, an old, it's an yeah, old English like mechanical a, car. Not like your cars, um, Anunzio. And and so, 
from a UX perspective, everybody's jealous about this gigantic iPad oh, that God. you have in the car. And to be, hon- to be honest, yeah, I don't know if I like it. You know, I just want to see your perspective. You know, aside of if it is dangerous so- or not to be distracted <laughs> about this gigantic iPad, but does it really work or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, how about that for a paradigm shift, right? So so actually, when I first saw Tesla make an announcement about the Model 3, like, I love just German cars, German design, you know, mechanical switches, orange lights, and everything like that. So when I first saw, like, even the steering wheel, I was like, that is such a cartoon character of a car. And then I went and sat in one and test drove it, and, like, it just felt nice and clean and Scandinavian Simple. and everything like that. Yeah. And even the design experience on the screen itself, like, Okay, there was a there was a novelty there that I was I was so pleased with for like the first couple of weeks of owning it. But then you actually got to drive to work every single day. You got to go and get groceries. You got to turn on the heat seater. You got to turn on all these different things inside of the car, the the lights in in the cabin and so on. And so much of it is actually just controlled through the touchscreen that yeah, the usability yeah, the the experience itself on the screen is great, except I'm also driving a vehicle. I'm the pilot of the car. And yeah, I'm having so to fiddle, fiddle with the switches and everything like that. Tactileness. Yeah, it doesn't have that tactileness. You're not feeling the things that you need to control. It's 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 but just to, glass. To some degree, though, you know, it's interesting because going back to what you were saying earlier, nuns, that it's almost clever in a way that the work that your team does is is helping kind of move the workflow and the paradigm forward without the user necessarily experiencing that huge pivot or shift or adjustment. But what I will say is that so much of my car is actually automated through voice that it actually forces me to start using more of the voice commands in the car to actually do things like set the climate control to 70 degrees instead of using a non-tactile touchscreen to actually make that change. So it's actually forcing me to become more at, at one with the actual yeah and 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 so you know to pick up on that just because i have an obsession with automobiles but i would tell you i mean i'm not saying that you can't push or promote or publish a new way of doing things because that's how I'm, I'm 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 digesting what you're saying i think though that just like anything else you need multiple ways of doing things and i think that that's the challenge in which we are faced with the enterprise is that like we need the ability to be able to experiment and do things a new way. So you have to have a really good foundational technology uh, capability. But at mm-hmm. the same time, prescribe certain ways of doing work that brings people along with us. And but yet we also need to promote new ways of doing that. So, I mean, the Tesla is a big leap in automotive engineering and infusing technology into the entire customer experience, because I think it's more than just the user interface. It's how it acts, the way it uses, the way it charges. Um, You know, there's a lot of automation involved with it and things. But what's fascinating is that they still offer ways of doing things like you did in the past. So, like, as you're bringing up the voice, there's still a way in which I can physically touch something to do something. And maybe one day there won't be. Maybe one day the whole thing is just a freaking screen. Um, They need to figure out the ergonomics of that because I think that thing's hideous. So I'm sorry, Mike. But... You know, they took a TV and just threw it in the dash. But um, I think even Tesla knows we're not there yet. And mm-hmm. even though I, I, I admire Elon Musk and everything that he's doing on a lot of levels, um, you know, it's not everybody's driving a Tesla. And to be honest with you, not everybody wants to either. And I think that... And they probably shouldn't. Yeah, well, yeah, true. But to me... That's actually enterprise software because fundamentally I'm someone who wants to modify something of an older paradigm from the seventies or sixties because of the visceral experience in which it offers. And I want to smell the fumes of gas and call that my new perfume or cologne, but some other people think I'm crazy and that's actually okay. And we need to be able to offer all that. And I know that sounds cray, but, um, that's innovation, actually, in its own right. That's awesome, guys. Uh, we are uh, at the end of the podcast. Um, I think we, so um, we didn't talk about food today. That's 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 too bad. You know, we're gonna have to talk about food and invite back. Yeah, where's your yeah, Where's your there, percent? There is no percent. There is water. You know, there is water here. Well, um, happy hour. What are you doing over here? 
Absolutely. So Nunzio <laughs> and Mike and Rick, thank you very much for being here. It has been very funny. And I look forward for the next podcast. Yes, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thanks, guys. Me. I appreciate Bye, it. Bye, guys. See ya.